The last of the standard building blocks that are used inside a computer, at least the last that we'll look at in this series of lectures, is the counter. Just as the word clock has a jargon meaning in computer architecture that's a bit different from its conventional meaning, meaning so also does the word counter. In a computer, a counter isn't used for counting things, or at least not always. Instead, it's most often used to remember which piece of a program the computer will execute next. You see, most of the time a computer reads the instruction it's going to execute from sequential locations in memory. So it's quite useful to have access to a piece of circuitry that remembers what the current location is and can work out what the next one will be. And that circuit is a counter. A counter can remember a number encoded using the binary notation and for any number in its range it can work out what the next number is. The only question is how. Well, remembering a number isn't difficult. We just need to set up enough flip-flops to contain all the bits of the number. The interesting part, or if you prefer the difficult part, is deciding how to predict the next number when what you know is the current number. We need to find some property of the binary number sequence that relates the bit sequence of a number to the bit sequence of its successor. If we can do that, then we'll be well on the way to solving this problem. It's easy to see a pattern in the least significant bit of a sequence of binary numbers. It continually alternates between 0 and 1. We can write this down formally in an equation that says that the 2 to the 0 bit at time t plus 1 is the inverse of the 2 to the 0 bit at time t. But what about the more significant bits? Actually, it's probably easier to think about decimal numbers for a moment. If you've ever, ever watched the digits ticking over on the odometer in an old car, say from 49,999 kilometres to 50,000 kilometres, you'll probably have noticed that when all the digits with a lower significance than the one we're watching change to a zero, then the more significant digit that we're watching increments. In fact, you don't need to watch all the less significant digits. Although it's much less fun, you can just watch the digit immediately to the right of the more significant digit that's going to change. Is the same thing true of binary numbers? Sure is. The more significant bits in a binary number behave just like the decimal digits on a car's odometer. For example, in the number 4, the most significant bit, the 2 squared bit, has just toggled from a 0 to a 1 at the same time as the 2 to the 1 bit has become a 0. This observation holds true for all the more significant bits in a binary number. And in general, we can say that the value of the 2 to the n bit at time t plus 1 will be the inverse of its value at time t if the 2 to the n minus 1 bit changed from a 1 to a 0 at time t plus 1. Now, as we've said, a set of flip-flops can be used to store the bits of the number. But that's not all the device does. It also has to generate a new number. Since we're dealing with a binary number system, a digit only ever toggles its value, converting between 0 and 1, or between 1 and 0, when the number increments. Now, we've already invented a device that stores a bit of information and can be made to toggle, the JK flip-flop. So the storage elements in our counter will be JK flip-flops. Next question. When does the toggling behaviour happen? For all the digits with more significance than the ones digit, it occurs when the digit's less significant neighbour changes from a 1 to a 0. Electrically, that corresponds to a falling edge on the voltage. So we use a falling edge triggered JK flip-flop. Well, now that that's decided, we can get started on the actual circuit design. The least significant digit toggles every time the number increments, so that's easy to arrange. We'll use a falling edge triggered JK flip-flop, connect a clock input to it, and make its J and K inputs both high. So now, every time a falling edge occurs on the clock, the output of the flip-flop will toggle. 
we can draw a voltage trace showing the relationship between the, the clock and the output from the flip-flop. The output is called Q0 because this flip-flop contains the least significant digit of the number, the 2 to the 0 bit. The trace, which is just a graph of voltage against time, shows that whenever the clock voltage decreases from 5 volts to 0 volts, the flip-flop's output toggles. This has the interesting consequence that the output from the flip-flop toggles at half the rate of the clock. So you can use a JK flip-flop to halve the rate of a clock signal if you want to. However, that's not our aim here. Let's get on with the next digit of the number. We want that to toggle whenever its less significant neighbour changes from a 1 to a 0, thereby generating a falling edge at its output. So we connect up a second flip-flop so that its clock input is supplied by the output of its less significant neighbour. And like the first JK flip-flop, this one's J and K inputs are both tied high to induce the desired toggling behaviour. And then we add another JK flip-flop connected up in the same configuration, and another. And we could add even more, of course, if we wanted to. So that's a 4-bit counter. And if we extend the voltage trace a little and have a look at the outputs from all the other, out, uh, all the other flip flops, we see that Q1 toggles when Q0 generates a falling edge, Q2 toggles when Q0 generates a falling edge, I beg your pardon, Q2 toggles when Q1 generates a falling edge, and Q3 toggles when Q2 generates a falling edge. If we turn those voltage traces on their end, so that they start at the top of the screen, then the bits of the number are listed from the most significant at the left to the least significant on the right, as they are in a normal number, and in the opposite order to the outputs that were shown on the circuit diagram on the previous slide. The combination of voltages is the f in the first section at the top of the trace corresponds to a 4-bit binary version of zero. And then the Q0 output changes, so the number becomes a 1. And then we see all the other 4-bit numbers being generated in sequence, till the output reaches 15, the largest 4-bit number, and then the output for the whole device will go back to 0, and the cycle will start again. But let's have another more critical look at this voltage trace. It's a bit idealised because it implies that when the output of a flip-flop changes, it changes at exactly the same instant as the clock edge that initiates the change. But it just ain't so. A flip-flop, like any other piece of circuitry, takes some time to react to a change on its inputs. So, when the falling edge occurs on the flip-flop's clock input, there's a slight delay before its output changes. And if that output is the clock input of another flip-flop, whose output is also due to change, then there's a slight additional delay before that second change occurs. So the voltage trace for Q0 needs to be shifted a little bit to the right. And the voltage trace for Q1 needs to be shifted further to the right. And Q2's trace needs to be shifted further to the right. And Q3's trace needs to be shifted still further. You can see that if the counter contained a lot of flip-flops, there would be a ripple effect when lots of bits changed, as the clock edges for the more significant bits got further and further away from the original clock edge. And that effect is why this sort of counter is called a ripple counter. This behaviour can be undesirable. For example, if a counter specified the value of something, the position of a lever, let's say, this isn't a very realistic example because inertia would cause a lever to take a lot longer to react than it would take for a ripple to pass through the flip-flops of a counter, but it gives us something to visualise, and we can extrapolate to digital logic systems in which the components might very well react if a counter didn't change clearly, cleanly from one value to another. We'll take up the story when the lever is at position 7 and the counter is about to increment. 
If the counter behaved ideally, the next value would be 8, of course. But that requires all four bits of the number to toggle. What actually happens is that the least significant bit toggles first, producing 6, then the 2's bit, producing 4, then the 4's bit, producing 0, and then the 8 bit, finally producing the desired value of 8. In the meantime, the lever has been flipping all around all over the show. So we need to do something better. The underlying cause of this problem is that, in a ripple counter, the flip-flops aren't clocked simultaneously. So we obviously need to organise them differently so that they are clocked simultaneously. It, well, we can do that easily enough by connecting them up all to the same clock, but that leaves us having to find a different way of specifying whether or not they should toggle on a particular cl clock edge. <laughs> we need to avoid using the bits of the new number as inputs into the calculation of the new number. Or to put it another way, we need to base our calculation of the bits of the new number solely on the bit pattern in the current number. So it's back to the drawing board for us. If we look at the binary number sequence again, we can quite happily use the same rule that we used before for deciding whether to toggle the least significant bit of the number, because it does relate the current and new numbers together. Well, <laughs> that was pretty easy. But what about the more significant bits? Let's look at the two squared bit and try to find something about the preceding number that indicates that it should toggle. That happens when the number is changing from 3 to 4. In the current number, that bit was 0, but it's been 0 three times before in 0, 1 and 2. So <laughs> that won't work as a condition. But <laughs> what is distinctive about the preceding number? What about that pair of 1s in the lower significant positions? That pattern hasn't occurred before. Is there a rule that a bit toggles when all the lower significant bits and the current number are zeros. Indeed there is. That rule works for all binary numbers, f with any number of bits, just as it worked for the odometer when we were changing from 49,999 to 50,000. When all the lower significant bits were nines, then the most significant bit changed from a four to a five, most significant digit. So, back to the binary example. We can write this out formally and say that the value of the 2 to the n bit at time t plus 1 is the inverse of its value at time t. If, for all values of m less than n, in other words, for all less significant bits, the 2 to the m bit is 1. And we can check the rule's generality by extending our binary number sequence one more row to show the transition from 7 to 8. That requires another column as well, because 8 is a 4-bit number. And we'll see that the 2-cubed bit toggles when all the bits in the current number, 7, are 1s. That's all the less significant bits. And incidentally, the 2-cubed bit isn't the only bit that toggles between 7 and 8. The 2-squared bit toggles as well. And look. The lower significant bits in the current number are both 1s. And the same observation applies to the 2 to the 1 bit. Our new improved counter will clock all its flip-flops simultaneously, so it's called a synchronous counter. Like the old ripple counter, it needs four JK flip-flops get memory that toggles, but as we've already said, those flip-flops are going to have to toggle at the same time, so we connect them all up to the same clock input. To get the least significant bit to toggle on every falling clock edge, we permanently wire its J and K inputs high. And now we get to the interesting bit. The next flip-flop needs to toggle when all the less significant bits, there's a grand total of one of those, when they all have a value of 1. Now, this looks very like the configuration that produced the ripple effect in the ripple counter, but here it doesn't. Why not? 
because the value of Q that we're inputting into J and K is the value that the first flip-flop has on its output at the clock edge. That's the value it had in the current number before any change initiated by the clock edge has time to get to the output. So the value that the second flip-flop sees at its J and K inputs is the old value of Q. In other words, it's the value of the less significant bit of the current number. The current number. The third flip-flop works in much the same way, except that it needs to know when the value of both the lower significance bits in the current number were 1. So it uses a two-input AND gate to detect this. And the fourth flip-flop similarly needs to know when three lower significance Q outputs were 1. So it uses a three-input AND gate. Now remember that all the flip-flops don't always toggle on every clock edge. But whichever flip-flops do toggle, they toggle simultaneously. And the bits in the new number are calculated entirely from bits in the old number. Now, you might ask if the AND gates will input the bits of the new number and initiate a new toggle. Well, they'll certainly receive those bits, but because of the propagation delay inside the flip-flops, they won't receive them until after the clock edge has gone away, so they don't cause any extra toggles. That's a relief. At this stage, you might like to put your skills to the test and design a, a special synchronous counter. Remember, that's one in which all the flip-flops are going to toggle simultaneously. A, a synchronous counter that can either count up or down according to the value of a control input, which we'll call up, not down. So if that's got a positive voltage, then a clock edge causes the counter to count up. And if the control input is zero, then a clock edge causes the counter to count down. I suggest that you approach this problem in two phases. First, just design a down counter. Have a look at the binary number system and work out what pattern occurs in the numbers when you're counting down and a flip-flop needs to toggle. You might find it helpful to remember that flip-flops have a not Q output that's the inverse of the Q output. Secondly, combine the synchronous up counter we've covered in the notes with the synchronous down counter you've designed for yourself. This will involve a steering circuit that chooses one or another signal to deliver to the J and K inputs of the flip-flops. And that's as much hint as I'm going to give you.